What's up baseball players and coaches, Coach Dan Blewett here. In today's video, we're gonna go over arm action in the pitching motion, which is one of those things that's, is, that's really difficult to figure out, especially for parents and for coaches. Sometimes it's like, hey, I see something with my young player. It looks funky, it looks weird. I'm not sure if we should change it or not. You know, I was taught this one thing when I was young as a coach, and, and now I don't know if I should teach my young players that today. Um, you know, I see a major leaguer on TV with a really unique arm action. Is that what we should be moving towards? So in today's video, we'll talk about what the arm action needs to do, what it should not do, things you should clean up, things you should leave alone, uh, the way the arm acts in the infield throw, the outfield throw, the pitching motion, all those different things we'll cover. There's a lot of miss, and this is one of the more complicated things, I think. One of the good trends in baseball is shortening and cleaning up arm actions. We use the word efficiency a lot, which I think sometimes just gets overused and just kind of means shorter, but shorter is not always better either. So stick around. In today's video, we're going to cover arm action, and I think this is a really big, again, talking point for pitching mechanics, so stay tuned. Okay, so number one, obviously I'm on a, a flat mound here, but I'm going to kind of like pretend I'm pitching this way. Number one, we need to figure out what is the goal of the arm action. So number one, the goal of the arm action in pitching is to get us to be on time when our stride foot, which for me is a righty, is my left foot, when my stride foot touches down, I want my arm to be in the right place with the right sort of mechanical characteristics. And what I mean by that is there's four main things that when my front foot just touches down, so when that cleat just hits the dirt, I want these four things essentially to happen. I want the ball to be facing the same direction as my chest, not center field like we used to teach, and we still teach unfortunately. So number one, I want the ball facing towards the same direction as my chest. I want my shoulder blades pinched all the way back. So when you see major league pitchers, you see still photos of them, you see this big like W shape that their elbows really pull back like they have wings. That's important because this hitches the arm up with the body as it starts to rotate. If we're out here and our shoulder blades are not pinched, we tend to just push the ball and shove it like the quote unquote throwing like a girl, which is not a term that I want to use because I work with a lot of softball players, but that was what that old term was. Pushing the ball is the, essentially what we're talking about. So pinching your shoulder blades back prevents you from pushing the ball. There's other factors involved, but that's one of them. Number three, the joint angle of your arm should be 90 degrees or a little bit less. It should never be like crazy far in here. This is a little bit more about how infielders throw, but for pitchers, it's 90 degrees and then sometimes just a little bit less. So somewhere, probably somewhere between like 70 and 90. If you're too far out here, you have this big obtuse angle. This, this lever gets really long and you can't get nearly as much power and your arm kind of gets draggy and laggy. If your elbow is way farther in here, your shoulder has extra forces to try to control as your arm flies out and that puts more strain through your shoulder as well. So 90 degrees or a little bit less. And then the last thing is that when our stride foot just touches down, our arm should be around like 10 o'clock. And what I mean by that is, if I'm facing center field, it shouldn't be straight up and down at this point. It also shouldn't be at nine o'clock. So if you're looking here, well, I guess this would be 12 and this is three. Depends which direction you're going. So it shouldn't be at three, it shouldn't be at 12. It should be somewhere like 11 or 10 in this angled range. And the reason is, as we start to rotate, it'll quickly get to the 12 o'clock position and then it'll get thrown back and we'll be on top of the ball really quick. When we're down here at nine or even lower and some pitchers land like this and they're very what we call late in their timing, the arm gets stuck behind too long and it doesn't get into the positions that we want to really get on top of the ball and all these things add more stress. So down here and here adds more stress and if you're to the top too soon that also adds more stress. So somewhere in this 10 to 11 o'clock range is what we want as we start to rotate through. So the goal of our arm action is to get us to that position. If we have a good arm action, it gets us when we just touch down with our stride that I'm at 90 degrees or less, my shoulder blades are pulled back, my hand is facing the same direction as my chest, not towards center and not really towards your ear either, and my arm is somewhere in this 10 to 11 o'clock range. That's the goal of the arm action. So if we don't know what we're trying to achieve, which are those four kind of parameters, then we don't really know what an arm action is, right? So that's the goal, and that's where we're trying to get to with our arm action. The next thing to know about the arm action is that it basically expands 
with the amount of time that we have. So a lot like uh, a gas, like oxygen, nitrogen, right? You learn this in science class that if you put nitrogen in a bottle, it expands and it gets less dense to fill out the container that it's in. The arm action is the same way. So the players that have the longest arm actions are pitchers and outfielders, because as a pitcher, my stride foot is in the air longer. So that means my arm can move around longer until it has to be in position. You just have more time to get there. Outfielders are the same way because they have typically a longer footwork, whether it's their out their crow hop or their pro step, they have more time to get ready when their stride foot hits. Because again, they need to be here when that's, that stride foot, that front foot hits the ground. Infielders have shorter arm actions, number one, because it's a necessity, right? They need to get rid of the ball quick, but also when they feel the ground ball, their feet are already down. And so as they move their feet, their feet are down again on the ground very, very fast. So your feet have to get, when it hits, you want to be here. So because of that, the arm action tends to be really short. You would never feel the ground ball step and then go like this. It would feel super awkward and look strange as well because why do I need to do this when I'm already, my body's ready to go as far as my lower half. Catchers are the same way. Obviously catchers have to get rid of the ball fast, but their feet are replaced so quick that it doesn't make sense to do this big long arm circle. So it's not that you're trying to teach a, circle, a circular arm action for a pitcher, because you're not. It doesn't really need to be taught in general. The only point is we need our arm here when our stride foot touches down, and your body figures this out on its own, that I have time so I can separate my hands down, I can take a little bit more length and still get there. Now, that being said, you don't always just have the perfect arm action naturally either. There are a lot of pitchers, myself included when I was younger, who sometimes your arm action just gets really long and it doesn't get to the right timing position by the time our foot hits. So that's the big question here is, for you as a pitcher or for you as a coach helping young pitchers, does their arm get to this position when they land? Are they here? Are they really long? Are they somewhere else? Are they too far back here? If those, are, if those things are the case, then they're a good candidate to say, okay, let's try to refine your arm action, smooth it out, make it more quote unquote efficient, and try to get you back on track. Because when your arm really lags, you don't get on top of your breaking balls well, you don't get on top of your fastballs really well, and it adds stress to your throwing motion. So, again, to me the word efficient does not mean shorter. There's no point in having the world's shortest arm action if we're just gonna sit here and wait there until our foot hits, which is kind of what some of the big leaguers are doing. There's a couple guys, uh, Trevor Bauer, Lucas Giolito, Joe Kelly, who have an exceptionally short arm action, where they could let their arms be a little longer and still probably get to the same position on time. But for pro athletes, if they decide that's the best thing for them to do, then they should absolutely do it. So I'm not criticizing any of those guys. It clearly works for them and it's an informed decision that they make. But for most pitchers, they don't need to do that. If they can have a longer arm action and get to their, their spot on time, then that's fine. There's no sense like shorter isn't always better. And that's my main point. So as a pitcher, we could all say, okay, well, it's more efficient to just throw like a catcher. Well, if that was the case, we probably would have been doing that long ago, but it isn't. It's a little bit more comfortable and the body seems to move naturally a little bit better when we have a little more length, but not too much length to our arm action. So let's talk a little bit about some of the arm action flaws that we don't want to see. So number one, we don't want the hands to just break straight up here because we're gonna get to the top of our motion too soon. And if our hands are going up, we're not really gonna get our shoulder blades pulling back. So hands breaking up, which I see a lot of young pitchers, sometimes they're here and then they go like this, that's not gonna give them a good arm action because they're getting to the top way too soon. Now they're in a ready to throw position and their lower half isn't there. So rule number one essentially for your arm action is that when your legs start to go down or when you're, you're uh, stride leg goes down, that's when your hands separate and your hands should always separate down. They don't have to go all the way down here, but they should always go down and then the elbow should start to pull back. Rule number two is your elbow should be the driver of your arm action, not so much your hand. So what I mean by that is if your hand is driving your arm action, this means my hand is like essentially leading the rest of my arm. What that does is it ends up locking your arm out and it's really extending it. When you think about it, again, my elbow's gotta be bent when I land. 
So why does my elbow ever need to straighten and then rebend? It doesn't. That's one of the really good advances that people have figured out in the last five, 10 years. Like you don't have any advantage to being super long and especially not to locking your elbow just to then unlock it and throw. It, that's very inefficient to use that word properly. So if your hand leads your arm action, it's gonna continue to move and extend that arm. So you should think about your elbow, once your hands have separated, as your elbow being the driver of your arm action. So your hands separate, and now the next move is my elbow is gonna to start to pull back. So when you see the really short arm actions, like Joe Kelly, Giolito, Trevor Bauer, which again, those work great for those guys, they're pitching well, so I'm not criticizing it. Um, as their hands separate, next they pull and pinch back, and then they're pretty much ready to go. Now, could they have some more length and still pull and pinch back and get on time? Sure, another player could, but maybe they figured out again that they don't want to do it that way. So again, the big thing is as your hands separate, elbows pull back, and then we're gonna get into position. So again, rule number two is elbow should drive the arm action, and rule number three is you never need to straighten your elbow. So if you, if you take video of yourself and you see that, hey, my elbow is locked at some point, or a player that you work with, my elbow has gotten locked at some point, that's something you wanna clean up and helping them say, hey, you know, drive from your elbow, move your arm with your elbow, not so much your hand, that's gonna help get them back on track a little bit more. And then my last big rule is the ball should never point to center field. This is a really old teach that, you know, there's a lot of throwing drills that kids do this. The ball should never point to center field. It doesn't make any sense. It should point in the same direction as your chest, which is mostly sideways, because as, I, as I'm here and I start to rotate, my arm is gonna fling back and I need to be in the center of the ball and then go forward. So if my wrist is sideways, now as I lay back, my hand is in the center of the ball. If my hand is facing center field, now as I rotate, my hand is still facing this direction, which just literally makes no sense. So I have to like have this weird wrist turning thing going on. And if we'd really stopped to think about it 20 years ago, we'd been like, why are we doing this? That doesn't make much sense. There's no power position that comes from it. It's not what your wrist does. Your wrist is gonna fix itself anyway. This is just an extra unnecessary, inefficient movement. So with those four rules, separating your hands down, not letting your elbow straighten, moving the arm with your elbow, not so much your hand, and not pointing the ball to center field, those things are gonna keep you all pretty and much in good shape. Because what the arm action should not look like is this sticking it way behind our back where then it becomes really difficult to get back to the position that we want to be in. So one other thing that influences your arm action is the wrapping of your upper body. So if you're very two-dimensional, so imagine there's a wall behind me and I'm just going right at the camera. So if I'm doing that, my arm's not gonna have a lot of motivation to get behind my body. However, if I start to wrap now, this is still just an extension of where my back is, but now I can stick it behind my body and it's much harder to get back out of that position. So lots of pitchers have a little bit of wrapping and a little bit of wrapping is okay and that's how some pitchers kind of stay on time in other ways and get some of their power. But when you see a player has excessive wrapping, it makes it really tough because this arm suddenly gets dug right really far behind their body and it's tough to get out of that hole essentially. So thinking about staying a little bit more shoulder pointed to the, to the target and keeping our arm action in two dimensions. And what I mean by two dimensions is I go down and I come back. Those are the two dimensions. I'm not really getting into this third dimension back here. That's kind of the thing to think about. So as I separate my hands, the elbow is pulling back, but mostly pinching my shoulder blades, and that's pretty much it. I just don't want to take my hand way back into this position. So those are the big things I think that you need to cover. Now, if you want to fix your arm action, you say, okay, well, what should you do? Number one, you should take slow motion video of yourself from a couple different angles. So not just from straight on, that's probably the one that helps the least, mostly from this view, from the side. So get slow motion video there, and also from the rear. So from here, so you can see what your arm is doing. So it's hopefully not this, but hopefully more of that, where it's hands break down, elbow drives, arm doesn't lock, and then we get up here. That's the big thing that you probably wanna do. And then you have to be conscious of it. So there's other drills that you can do. Some of them are uncomfortable. Some of them are more comfortable. One of them, I don't have a towel with me at the moment, but you take a rolled up towel, put it in your arm, 
and because you're squeezing it there, it prevents you from reaching out. And so you can go through your arm action and it helps keep you a little bit tighter rather than straightening you out. Some players I work with absolutely hate that drill. I personally hated it. I felt like it's very uncomfortable. I never got the hang of it. A lot of players are the same way. Some kids are like, hey, this is fine. I don't mind doing this. It kind of makes sense. So whether you put like a little Swiss ball on your arm or a little rolled up towel, either one's okay. They can help you fix that arm action a little bit. The other thing is just having some cueing where it's all right, I'm gonna to try to keep the ball to my chest a little longer. And again, I'm gonna pull from my elbow. My elbow is gonna move my arm rather than my hand. That tends to help. You can also do shadow drills in your house with your wall behind you. So get maybe six inches from the wall. That way, bang, you hit your hand on the wall if you start to wrap it and stick it way behind you. So that was something I did in college and that seemed to work pretty well. Also just trying to eliminate too much extra wrapping helps. But again, this is a solution that I wouldn't say is a very cookie cutter one. This is something that you definitely need to take video of yourself, try some different things, tinker, and know that there's not one clear solution for every player. Every player's arm action is gonna be different. That's why, again, the big leagues, you see a million different variations. And I wouldn't say that anything is wrong for any given player. Although if you did see a big leaguer who's like, boom, way back here, I think most pitching coaches today would agree that's not the best way for him to throw. But that being said, um, this is again, a really specific thing. So you don't wanna say, I'm gonna em emulate this pitcher or this MLB pitcher. You just wanna figure out, do I kind of fall into these four rules that I've uh, found today? Does my elbow lock? Do I stick it way too far behind my back? Do my hands break in a strange way? Um, and do I get my shoulder blades pulled all the way back? Is the ball facing the same direction as my chest? And is my elbow at 90 degrees or less? If you're hitting all those conditions, then you're probably in good shape. If you're starting to miss on some of those in that checklist, then you probably need help and you probably need to start taking some video and diagnosing it, okay? Thanks for watching. I know this is a long video. I appreciate you. I'm Coach Dan Blewett. Check out the video description links. Um, I have online courses. I have two pitching books. So I have lots of other resources if you're trying to learn more about baseball. Lastly, please subscribe to the channel, share this with a friend, and I'll see you in the next video.